Most video games tend to rely on villains a lot. They're the opposing force to your heroes and they sort of give you all this narrative impetus and drive along the series of events that makes you feel like an absolute champion of good or evil. Usually good. But in some video games, you and the villain can actually have a lot in common. You both want to be the good guys, but while you do it through general acts of kindness, the other side tends to rely on subjugation, inhuman experiments, or machines that are rather prone to deadly error. One way or another, their quest to do good is nullified by their own poor judgment. I'm Jess from What Culture, and here are 10 video game villains who had the right idea, but terrible execution. Number 10, Detlef, The Witcher 3. The Witcher 3's DLC, Blood and Wine, tells a compelling tale of manipulation and deceit. It starts off with Geralt hunting down the so-called Beast of Beauclair, and ends with him realizing that his target, a higher vampire by the name of Detlef, is actually a scorned lover who was manipulated to commit murders for his beloved Sayana. Given that Detlaf is not an aggressive vampire, or at least wasn't back in the day, and that Sayana tricked him into committing several murders by faking her own kidnapping and then threatening him, it's obvious that Detlaf would want to get some comeuppance. However, his way of wanting to go about this vengeance is a little overkill when it comes to what Sayana did in the first place. You see, unlike Sayana, who tricks one vampire to get her way, Detlaf summons a whole army of them to attack Beauclair. And it's not only that. Whereas Sayana made Detlaf kill people who were responsible for her exile, Detlaf's rage makes him order the death of hundreds of innocent residents of the city, arguably making him the worst villain. Number 9. The Master, Fallout. The Master is one of the most iconic Fallout villains. He's a pre-war scientist who merged with a supercomputer and several other humans and mutants, becoming the mastermind behind Project Unity and the Army of Super Mutants. The Master's activity in the game largely involves calling raids on local settlements and then turning the victims into more of his soldiers. His actions are utterly irredeemable, and yet the Master is secretly quite the humanitarian, and pretty incompetent at being one. As you progress through the story, you learn that the Master's plan is actually to help humanity survive the apocalypse. He realizes that the irradiated environment can easily kill humans, and that they might wage even more devastating wars on each other as a result. He wants to inject everyone with the super mutant virus in order to help humans overcome their violent nature and adapt to their new environment. But his plan has the opposite effect, as his super mutants ultimately cause more wars and are completely infertile. In fact, if you point this out to the master in your final confrontation, he'll be so distraught at hearing the news and having this realization, he'll commit suicide. So, yeah. Number eight, Mr. Freeze, Batman Arkham City. Mr. Freeze is one of the most iconic members of Batman's gallery of villains and plays an equally memorable role in Rocksteady's Batman Arkham series. Like his comic book counterpart, the Arkham Mr. Freeze is a completely misguided villain who simply wants to save his wife from a mysterious terminal illness. And for some reason, his method of accomplishing this is throwing her in a giant freezer and then trying to turn Gotham City into the second South Pole. Yes, apparently being a brilliant scientist does not make you a brilliant decision maker. Now, the interesting contrast between Arkham's freeze and the comic book one is that in Arkham Knight, the Sub-Zero villain actually gets to see the full error of his ways. After Batman helps rescue his wife Nora, the woman is released from her icy cage and tells her husband that he should have let her die naturally, since that way he wouldn't ruin his own life. The two then share a really touching moment as they both realize that given their deteriorating conditions, they're kind of headed to death anyway, but they can do it together, reunited, in love. For a bit, for, for a last little bit, because it turns out that freezing the world was not a great solution. Number seven, Lusamine, Pokemon Sun and Moon. Lusamine is the main antagonist of Pokemon Sun and Moon. On the surface, she's the kind and caring president of the Ether Foundation, an organization dedicated to preserving Pokemon. 
but in reality, she's an obsessive control freak that will do anything to protect her children, even if it means unleashing the dangerous ultra beasts into the world. Now, because of her neglect of her actual children and the excessive methods of preserving Pokemon by stuffing them into cryotanks or collaborating with criminals to get new protégés, Lusamine is considered an irredeemable villain. And while that's absolutely true given all the disasters she's caused, it's hard to not argue that, at least when we're talking about Pokemon villains, her intentions are surprisingly good. Between Pokemon thieves and gangs who want to destroy the world with floods and volcanic eruptions because they can, it's a nice change of pace to have a villain who has idealistic goals and is unfortunately just too obsessed about accomplishing them. It adds a nice bit of complexity into the story too, which is always welcome in a Pokemon game. Number 6. King DDD – Kirby's Adventure King DDD is the typical villain of Kirby games, using his self-proclaimed royal position to take stuff from other people and just cause general mayhem and shenanigans. For this reason, the fact that he tries to do a good thing for once in Kirby's Adventure is a genuinely surprising twist, but also the reason why he ends up causing more harm than good. In Kirby's Adventure, King DDD discovers that everyone's dreams are being haunted by a mysterious nightmare. He then manages to seal it away with the Star Rod, which he splits into seven pieces and divides between himself and his closest companions for safekeeping. See? That's a good thing. Except that accidentally, he didn't realize that by destroying the Star Rod, he actually prevented everyone from being able to dream, which is a bad thing. This failure to plan causes Kirby to investigate and eventually take the Star Rod pieces back from DDD and his crew. When he puts the Star Rod back together, he releases the nightmare and lets it continue its invasion of the Dreamland. Which really begs the question, why couldn't King DDD just tell everyone about the danger and work together to stop it instead of solving it himself with his half-baked ideas? Number 5. Lady Maria of the Astral Clock Tower – Bloodborne the world of Bloodborne and many FromSoft games is built on tragic narratives, and in Bloodborne specifically, one of the most tragic of all is built around the game's villain, Lady Maria. This deadly but dapper hunter isn't just a boss that's likely to make you rage at your screen for a good few hours, but also a well-intentioned heroine who, through very poor choices, becomes a terrifying villain. Lady Maria is the central figure and main antagonist of the Old Hunters DLC due to her involvement in the horrifying events which led to the creation of the Hunter's Nightmare. Although she started off as a talented hunter, eventually her quest to rid the world of abominations in the name of the church led her to participating in the slaughter at the fishing hamlet and the mutation of the corpse of Koss, creating the curse and trapping everyone in the nightmare. The game implies that Maria killed herself after not being able to cope with her crimes, but then she died and then became the host of the Nightmare, who then is the ultimate villain that needs to be destroyed in the DLC for the dream to end. So that didn't work out on multiple levels and kind of feel bad for her. Number four, Superman, Injustice. Superman is the ultimate superhero, not necessarily because of his godlike powers, even though those certainly help, but rather because of his kind heart and unrelenting need to help everyone. However, the Injustice series takes a darker spin on the caped protector of Metropolis, showing that even good intentions can lead somebody down an evil path. In the game, Superman becomes so heartbroken after Joker kills his beloved Lois that he decides to break his no-kill rule and resolve the villain hero's conflict once and for all. He bands together with other like-minded heroes to kill all the villains and eventually turns into a fully-fledged dictator trying to take over the world. However, although his transformation is Batman's worst nightmare come true, Superman's goal is technically noble. He still wants to protect innocent people people and make the world a better place, it's just that his methods have gotten more extreme. And in a way, who could blame him? I mean, you would eventually snap too if your beloved city was getting blown up by aliens and maniacs every two weeks. Number 3. Walker – Spec Ops The Line Spec Ops The Line is a brilliant spin on the shooter genre that starts off feeling like your typical shoot the baddies kind of game, but the more you play, it quickly turns into a traumatizing thriller showcasing the true horrors of war. 
The best example of the game's unique take on the shooter genre is Martin Walker, the game's protagonist, who also serves as the game's antagonist. Although he starts off as a sympathetic character searching for surviving members of his squad in Dubai, you quickly discover that in order to serve his country, Walker has to commit plenty of atrocities and they take a terrible toll on his mental stability. As the game progresses, Walker and his squad become greater and greater menaces. And depending on what choices you make, Walker can give in to his anger even more, turning from an aspiring army hero to an unhinged killer with little to no morals. This man is the perfect example of how even the most well-intentioned person who's assured themselves that they have good morals can become evil when they're put in a situation where it seems like only violence and cruelty are the solution. Number 2. Handsome Jack, Borderlands 2 There's no denying that Handsome Jack from the Borderlands series is an irredeemable monster. Some people might argue in his favour because of his charms and fun personality, but between turning his own daughter into a human computer and trying to awaken a Godzilla-like bioweapon to terrorise Pandora, he's definitely the villain of the game. This said, if you were to defend Jack, there's a point to be made about his intentions. After all, although he is indeed a massively narcissistic psychopath, his goal is to be the hero. I mean, he already sees himself as the hero. In Jack's eyes, all of his plans and evil schemes are meant to rid Pandora of criminals, and he wants to bring some order to an otherwise chaotic and highly dangerous planet. His methods are detestable, but at the same time, you can't say he's lying about his plans for Pandora, as after he takes over Hyperion in the prequel, he does bring order to its operations by stopping the Claptrap Rebellion and enhancing its Iridium profits. If he wasn't such a callous narcissist, then his heroic aspirations and skills could probably have made Pandora a better place. Number 1. Ishmael Asher, Fallout 3 Fallout 3's The Pit add-on introduces one of the most depressing and disturbing places ever shown in the Fallout series, and that's really saying something, but this place really is something. The titular remains of Pittsburgh are where raiders rule over everyone with an iron fist, and the streets are filled with destitute slaves and deathly ill transients. The main antagonist of the DLC is Asher, a former Brotherhood soldier who basically rounded up the raiders in the area and unified them under his command to take over the city. Asher's rule over the pit makes him the unequivocal villain to his people as his soldiers act with pure cruelty, and most of the people in the pit are either slaves or kidnapped slaves from nearby settlements. However, although his methods are certainly inhumane, Asher's mission is actually pretty inspired. For all the crimes he and his raiders commit, Asher's goal is to improve the pit situation and turn it from an infested war zone into a genuine community that has a functioning industry and a strong, reliable army. You can tell he truly believes he's doing the right thing as well, as he prefers to call his raiders soldiers and his slaves workers. Doesn't really change anything, but he does call them that. While none of that excuses him, you can kind of see in a certain perspective that he's trying to work with what he has to make the best of the situation. And also, you can only imagine what a dumpster fire this place was before he showed up. 